Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Carolee McGrath. I'm with Media Relations from the Diocese of Springfield. I just wanted to give you a quick rundown of what to expect uh, this morning at the press conference. Bishop Byrne will make opening remarks, and he'll be followed by Jeff Trant, who's a director of the Office of Safe Environment and Victim Assistance. And then Doug Cole also is joining us this morning. He is a member of the survivor community and will share his thoughts and a little bit about his story as well. Um, following Doug's um, talk, we will be open for questions for both Bishop Byrne and for Jeff Trant as well. So at this time, I'll introduce Bishop Byrne. Thank you for coming today. When I first came to the Diocese of Springfield late last year, I made a commitment not only to transparency, but to healing with regard to the abuse crisis which has overshadowed our church. I am well aware that the past efforts in the Diocese of Springfield have not achieved that outcome. In fact, some have caused even more harm. Two years ago, my predecessor, Archbishop Rosansky, Having heard these complaints, initiated a total restructuring of the Safe Environment and Victim Assistance Office with the hiring of Mr. Jeffrey Trant. Jeff's tireless efforts at improving and reorganizing this important work have set us on a much better path. But make no mistake about it, we still have far to go. Today we take another important and somber step forward with the release of an expanded online listing of all those with findings of credibility as determined by the Misconduct Commission, which operated from 1994 to 2004, and the Review Board, which has operated since 2004. You will now find 61 names listed at the diospringfield.org, up from 21 that had previously been listed. It now includes diocesan clergy, even if they were deceased at the time that the allegation came forward religious order members, and clergy from other dioceses, and lay employees. Let me be clear, these are not new allegations. Most take back decades. They are newly listed names. I offer my most sincere apology to the victims of these crimes, not only for the crimes themselves, but for the failures of the diocese in handling the courageous victims who came forward to report that they had been abused. Acknowledging a survivor's allegation to be credible brings the truth of these horrific experiences into the light. This expanded disclosure of names is necessary to fulfilling my commitment to transparency and healing. It is my hope that anyone who has experienced the crime of sexual abuse will come forward and, and report the abuse to law enforcement, no matter when it occurred. Today's release will no doubt bring fresh, will bring fresh pain to the wounds experienced by survivors and their family members. In recognition of their pain, I am inviting clergy, religious, and laity to join me Thursday evening at 7 p.m. at St. Michael's Cathedral for a special prayer service to ask God's divine guidance in helping victim and survivors heal. We pray also for the continuing resolve to pursue the work ahead that is necessary to effect lasting trust among us and assure that all the safety of all members of our community in our care. I now turn it over to Jeff Trant, who will explain the particulars of the newly expanded list. Thank you, Bishop Byrne. Disclosure of childhood sexual abuse is a complex and lifelong process. Research shows that many children do not disclose sexual abuse immediately after it occurs. Many children, in fact, do not disclose their abuse for years, if at all, and factors such as gender and age at the time of abuse influence the disclosure process. In fact, many adult survivors of child sexual abuse have never disclosed their abuse to anyone. The short-term and long-term consequences of child sexual abuse can be devastating. Children who are sexually abused are at greater risk for mental health problems, 
including but not limited to post-traumatic stress and other anxiety symptoms, depression, and suicide attempt. Adult survivors of child sexual abuse are more likely to report substance abuse problems, are at an increased risk for long-term mental health problems, and have adverse health outcomes. Fear, shame, and self-blame are symptoms associated with sexual abuse. They are also significant barriers to reporting childhood sexual abuse. Consequently, many survivors shoulder the burden of abuse alone and suffer in silence. Disclosure is a critical step for seeking help in accessing services. For that very reason, publishing information about credibly accused clerics and diocesan personnel provides survivors with information that may be helpful with their healing process and let others who are privately coping with their abuse know they are not alone. Beginning last year, I led a team consisting of staff from the Diocesan Office of Safe Environment and Victim Assistance that conducted a systematic review of all case files of available allegations of sexual abuse by clergy and other diocesan personnel. The other members of the team were C. Lee Bennett and Jennifer Murphy. The purpose of this review was to obtain a baseline for past determinations of allegations of sexual abuse of a minor that had been established since the diocese first implemented a process in 1992 where lay people with professional backgrounds and expertise in clinical psychology, social work, education, child abuse, criminal justice, and the law assessed allegations and provided consultation to the bishop. For the review, sexual abuse of a minor was defined as any interaction between an adult and a child under the age of 18 in which the child is used for sexual pleasure, stimulation, or sexual gratification of the perpetrator or observer. Sexual abuse can include both touching and non-touching behavior, and this includes the manufacture, distribution, and viewing of child pornography. The team reviewed files from the Misconduct Commission that was established in 1992 and the review board which succeeded the Misconduct Commission in 2004 after the Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People was promulgated by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Each case was reviewed by two independent raters to determine the nature of the allegation such as what was the age of the victim at the time of the reported abuse, whether the allegation was referred to and assessed by the Misconduct Commission or Review Board, and whether the allegation was determined to be credible, not credible, or undetermined. In cases where there was a disagreement, a third rater was brought in and final determinations were made. Next, criteria were established for the development of the present list. Inclusion criteria were allegations of sexual abuse of a minor by a bishop, priest, deacon, other religious or lay employee who is now or was incarnated, individuals assigned to public ministry or employed by the Diocese of Springfield. Next, the allegation has been determined to be credible by the Misconduct Commission or the Review Board and or the allegation has been determined to be credible by another diocese eparchy or religious order, and this finding has been verified by the Diocese of Springfield through a primary source. Exclusion criteria included allegations of sexual abuse of a minor that were not assessed by either the Misconduct Commission or Review Board. Allegations that were assessed and did not result in a documented finding of credibility and or allegations of individuals not associated with and outside the jurisdiction of the Diocese of Springfield. A subsequent case review was conducted using the established criteria and supporting documentation was retrieved to confirm rating classifications. In February of 2021, the diocese engaged Dr. Reina Lamade to conduct an independent review of the team's process of reviewing allegations and the classification of findings to ensure the process was rigorous and consistent. 
Dr. Lamade is a forensic psychologist and an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Her research and practice area of specialization includes sexual violence, trauma, veterans, and psychological and forensic assessment and decision-making processes, including risk assessment. The list released today reflects the findings of the review conducted by the Office of Safe Environment and Victim Assistance, which were confirmed by Dr. Lamade's independent review. The list contains three main categories. The first category, finding of credibility of an allegation of sexual abuse of a minor, contains the names of individuals who have one or more credible allegation that was determined by the Misconduct Commission or the Review Board. The category is divided into subcategories, five subcategories. First, incarnated in the Diocese of Springfield, followed by deceased clergy, incarnated in the Diocese of Springfield for whom criminal or canonical proceedings were not completed, other dioceses, religious order, and lay employees. The second category includes allegations against those who served in public ministry within the Diocese of Springfield, and the allegation was reviewed and determined to be credible by another diocese or religious order. The third category includes the name of one priest who was credibly accused of sexual misconduct with an adult and whose name was added to the previously published list in 2017. In 2019, Pope Francis issued a motu proprio, which is most similar to an executive order, titled Vos Estis Lux Mundi, that established a definition for a vulnerable person. Currently, the diocese is conducting a review of its policies and procedures concerning sexual abuse, assault, and misconduct with a vulnerable person. Therefore, at this present time, only the name of this one priest is being published while this review is underway, which will also include the revision to the Code of Conduct, or excuse me, to the Code of Canon Law that were promulgated just yesterday by Pope Francis. In total, there are 61 individuals for whom an allegation of sexual abuse of a minor were determined credible, and there is independently verifiable evidence to substantiate each name that is included on the list. The breakdown by subcategory is as follows. Incarnated in the Diocese of Springfield, 20 individuals. Deceased clergy incarnated in the Diocese of Springfield for whom criminal or canonical proceedings were not completed, 23 individuals. Other diocese, three individuals. Religious order, six individuals laypersons, three individuals, public ministry within the diocese established by another diocese or religious order, five individuals, and sexual misconduct with an adult, one individual. The diocese has taken great care in the preparation of this list. However, we recognize that this information may still be imperfect. If any survivor believes an individual is missing from the list, we are fully committed to providing every person with the opportunity to participate in the review process. This begins with reporting an allegation to the district attorney for the jurisdiction where the abuse is reported to have occurred, followed by the diocesan review after law enforcement has completed their review. We will then update the list to reflect new determinations of credibility, and the list will truly be a living document. Any person who is a victim of sexual abuse by a representative of the church is encouraged to contact law enforcement to make, a, uh, to make a report. Sexual abuse of a child is a crime, whether it occurred one year ago, 10 years ago, or 50 years ago. This heinous crime must first and foremost be evaluated by law enforcement. We also encourage victim survivors to report their abuse to the diocese by calling 800 842-9055 or sending an email to reportabuse at diospringfield.org. The diocese is ready to provide support, which includes access to our counseling program and funds mental health care and provides pastoral support as well. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Doug Cole.
Good morning. Um, it's with a heavy heart that I come forth regarding the abuse I endured at the hands of a Catholic priest at my parish in Shelburne Falls more than 40 years ago. The most important reason I come forth is to give survivors like myself the encouragement to help them heal. As you can imagine, this journey has not been an easy one. Anyone who has endured any type of abuse has the right to be heard so they can start their own healing process. Please note and be aware that abuse happens more than just within the Catholic Church. Also, please note that I come forth today to tell my story that has been in the works for several weeks that I wanted to be able to share this with the public that I am a survivor. It took great courage for me to tell my therapist and Father William Lunny, the parish priest in Shelburne Falls back in 2018. Once the process started from telling Father William Lunny and then going to the diocese, there was many errors. The process took well over a year and there was many errors and it felt like I was being re-victimized once again. The reason I mention this is many changes have taken place since I came forth as we are here today to listen to those folks that are associated with credible cases against them. It saddens me, but it also gives me hope in the healing process. I am not a spokesman for the diocese. I am using my faith and the Holy Spirit to help fellow survivors with the support of the diocese. I want you all to know that this journey is different for every one of us survivors. I am blessed. Sorry. To have my faith and hope that this will help other survivors in their healing path. Again, please reach out and tell your story. You are not alone. I once called myself a victim, but I am a survivor. I am in great hopes that this speech reaches one person and gives them the support, the hope, and love to begin their process. A special thanks for the continued support that I have received from Rosie, my family, Father Bill, Jeff Trant, Jonathan, and most recently, Bishop Byrne. Thank you again. Thank you, Doug, for that powerful witness. Uh, we're now available for any questions that you might have. Yes, Stephanie. Um, Bishop, so I applaud your efforts today, but I feel like this might be a bit of a double-edged sword. Did, did you have any concerns that updating this list once again, with information you've obviously been in possession of for some time, might further cut into the credibility of the diocese? Well, in order, the, the primary uh, motive is is to make sure that we help victim survivors and to make this uh, 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 information available so that people will come forward like Doug and receive the help the healing um, that that they deserve in order to uh, for a wound to heal it must be completely cleaned out and so this is a debreeding of that wound so that, and that can be a painful process, but in the, that uh, process then true healing can begin. So we are, uh, my, we are 
I'm honoring my commitment to transparency and to communication in this process. If people want to hear, if we want people to hear the message of the gospel, they need to trust the teller of the story. And until we have uh, opened our windows and our doors and let this information be known, that, that trust can never be built. Do you have a written policy in terms of criteria of who might be added to the list? In this current list? Prior to this. You would know the history better than I. Yeah, so the question is, did the diocese previously have a policy of who was eligible to be included uh, on the list? Uh, and, and so certainly uh, this predates my tenure with the diocese. Uh, however, the stated policy was that uh, a cleric had to be living at the time that the allegation came forward. They also had to be a priest or, uh, or a religious or a cleric of the Diocese of Springfield. Um, and, uh, and there had to be a finding of credibility. Uh, and the underlying principle uh, of that old policy uh, was that uh, the, the cleric would have an opportunity uh, to respond to the allegation. So is this a recognition that that policy was flawed? Survivors, advocates, families uh, have long called on the diocese to provide a more full-throated accounting of what the diocese uh, has known and the, and the determinations that it has made in the past since the uh, review, since the misconduct commission was first established in 1992, uh, as Bishop Byrne ha has I think said quite uh, quite often, since even before his installation, uh, a commitment to transparency, a commitment to communication, and a commitment to healing uh, really is the precept uh, that underlies the current revision. I just wanted to go back to. One comment that Bishop Brown, um, kind of at the top of your comments, you said, I'm well aware that past efforts in the Diocese of Springfield have not achieved that outcome. In fact, some efforts caused more harm. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Yes, I can. You know, when we, when we look back at uh, people, victims, and victim survivors who came forward to uh, to speak to the diocese. There was, in an effort, I think, uh, to protect the institution, perhaps, uh, uh, always an, an ad, somewhat of an adversarial relationship. And, uh, and this is a culture shift that we need to, to change, to recognize that trauma-informed uh, trauma-informed uh, reception and hearing and treatment is is the modality that we need to be working within uh, so that we don't find ourselves causing more harm to those who have already been uh, so devastated. So as I said before, our focus uh, and the focus of all these efforts is first and foremost the healing and the recognition and of the victim survivors. And that's why we have expanded this list and uh, made that available so that we keep ourselves uh, focused on healing and transparency. Yes? Uh, I didn't miss this earlier, but what was the range of years of the abuses perpetrated by those who were newly added? Uh, the, uh, so the, the inclusion criteria included all of those cases that had been reviewed by either the Misconduct Commission or the Review Board. However, the allegations well precede uh, that period of time. Uh, this information is published at diospringfield.org. Uh, however, uh, in the late 40s uh, is, is uh, among the earliest uh, allegations that have been deemed to be credible. Any other questions? Oh, just one more, sorry. Um, can you say how many cases you're currently reviewing are now in the process of reviews still? Uh, 
One of the significant developments uh, over the past 14 months uh, truly has been the development uh, in the execution of a memorandum of understanding uh, between the district attorneys of Western Massachusetts uh, and the diocese. So I have to start by acknowledging first and foremost District Attorney Galuni, District Attorney Harrington, and District Attorney Sullivan uh, for their leadership uh, and, uh, and, and truly their partnership in the development of a framework for how abuse cases are reported. And so first and foremost, it is absolutely critical that when an allegation comes in, it is first and foremost reported uh, to the appropriate uh, law enforcement agency for that jurisdiction. Uh, the provisions of the MOU call for uh, the diocese to suspend any fact finding uh, while that case uh, is being reviewed by law enforcement. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, I'm not prepared to comment uh, on any cases that are presently uh, under review by, by law enforcement. If there's no further questions, thank you so much uh, for coming today. For those watching on live stream, if you do have further questions, feel free uh, to reach out to me and I can uh, facilitate that as well. Have a good day. Thank you.